In wrapping up, what follows is, in my opinion, the most important information on this entire DVD. It does not help to accept that there was a flood if one does not come to repentance and seek a deep relationship with our Father in heaven. It is difficult to have a deep relationship with him if we do not know the basics about him. This section seeks to present some critical information which I hope you will find of value. As a fundamental principle, seek truth, not error. Our world is full of error. Do not get stuck on it. I have error I do not know about. Do not get stuck on what you think I have in error. If I knew it was error, I wouldn't have it, would I? Seek the truth the Almighty Creator, you are the eternally self-existing, has for you today. When you meet people, focus on the truth they have that you lack and share the truth you think you have. Do not get into arguments. Share what you hold to be truth and gather what another may have that is truth and then, if you cannot agree, move on. There are many lost truths. Those I think are most important are summarized here. Words in curly brackets are words that are widely used, but which I understand to be incorrect. Talking about seeking truth, not error, the graphic on the screen represents what is known as a radar plot. The center of the circle look, represents 0% error, and the circumference of the circle represents 100% error. On the left-hand side, we see somebody who has a mixture of a lot of error and a lot of truth. On the right-hand side, we see somebody who has large amounts of error, but one or two important truths. In the middle, we see somebody who has a very high level of truth and only one area of major error. Unlikely that anybody on the planet conforms to the middle graphic right now. Looking at a few other examples, more likely that the average person is a big mishmash of truth and error, uh, as represented on the right-hand side. The central graphic represents an interesting situation. Two human beings, both of whom have got a lot of truth and a lot of error, but the tr truth that the one has corresponds to the error the other has. So while collectively they have a very deep revelation of the things of Almighty, they're at loggerheads because their truths are so different and their errors are so different. There are many errors and confusion relating to the names of the Almighty and to others. The true name of the Creator is Yah, Y-A-H. His most widely used name is Yah, the eternally self-existing, which is frequently translated as Yahweh or Yahweh. His name is not the Lord, which is a literal translation of Baal, which is a pagan name. The Lord is therefore blasphemous and should be avoided, and it is grace that the Almighty has answered prayer in that name. The man commonly referred to as Jesus was a Hebrew. He was not a Greek. Jesus is a derivative of the Greek word Iesus, which in turn is derived from Zeus, which is the name of a pagan deity and is therefore blasphemous. Avoid the use of Jesus at all times. His true name was Yahushua, which means Yah is salvation. This is the message which he came to bring, and he should always be referred to by this name, Yahushua. It is an insult and disrespectful to call the most powerful human being in existence, who is king of all human kings and lord of all human lords, by anything other than his correct name. God is a pagan name and therefore blasphemous. The word translated God or God means mighty one or, or almighty when applied to the creator, or mighty one applied to anyone else. A ruler or judge is a mighty one and can therefore technically be referred to as a god, but in actual fact the word God should not be used at all, except perhaps for Satan in the sense of God or mighty one of this world. Yeshua, Jesus, is a mighty one and therefore can technically be recalled a God, but it is disrespectful to do so. This duality of meaning gives rise to confusion. The word Christ derives from the Greek Christos. It is used as a substitute for a technical term which refers to the impartation of the Spirit of the Almighty in a form of smearing that is called anointing. Thus Jesus Christ means Yeshua, the anointed of Yah. Christ Jesus means the anointing of the Spirit of Yah that was upon Yeshua. Christ means anointed one or the anointed of Yah. Christ is not Yeshua's name. Christ is not synonymous with Yeshua or interchangeable with Yeshua. 
Any believer filled with the Spirit of Yah is an anointed one, that is, a Christ. It is confusing and disrespectful to call Yeshua Christ rather than to refer to him by his correct name, Yeshua the anointed of Yah, or simply Yeshua. Yeshua was executed on a stake, a length of tree trunk, not a cross. The cross is a pagan symbol that has pornographic symbolism and should be avoided. The word holy actually means set apart and relates to separation from the things of the world. Bible is derived from the Greek biblios, which means book, as in the Afrikaans bibliotheek, meaning library. The book does not claim a title for itself, it is merely a compendium of writings, and different compendia appropriate the title Bible. The word should be avoided. All versions of the book contain error, and none claim to be without error or fully inspired. There are texts in the book which are inspired by Yah and recorded with varying levels of accuracy. It is an important reference work. Baptize is another confusing term which should be correctly translated immerse. It refers to full immersion in water and is a routine procedure for cleansing that is laid down repeatedly in Leviticus. It is not mechanically possible to immerse a pe person with a thumb dipped in a cup of water and therefore the debate about what constitutes baptism is eliminated. Immersion is the prescribed ordinance of full immersion. We should immerse regularly. Angel is a representation of a word that means messenger. It is more helpful to refer to them as messengers because that is what they are. Marriage means sexual intercourse with a virgin, widow, or tr truly divorced female. In Yah's terms, the joining of a, of a man, and, man and a female in some ceremony is invalid and is an adultery unless the woman satisfies one of the above conditions. Covenant includes a death penalty. Father Yah has made numerous covenants with human beings, starting with Adam and thereafter with Noah, Abram, Isaac, Jacob, David, Yeshua, etc., and with many others. He still makes covenants today. Failure to observe a covenant leads to death. It may result in premature death in this life, failing which it will lead to eternal death. Thus, while much is made of the covenant through Yeshua, it should be seen in context and it must be understood that willfully and repeatedly breaking that covenant will lead to eternal hellfire set out in Hebrews 6. There is judgment in this life. We may request judgment in this life in order that we are not judged in the life to come. We will be judged in any event. Any illness, accident, loss of any sort is a judgment. Judgment requires the prosecutor, Satan or one of his messengers to bring charges before the court of heaven. Yeshua, as our advocate, pleads for mitigation of sentence, mercy, etc., as may be applicable. Father Yah, as the judge, hands down the sentence. Satan is his, and his messengers and demons execute or carry out the sentence, for example, by causing an accident. Judgment in this life is to be sought and desired. It trains us, it allows us to learn. It is grace that helps us to learn and avoid damnation in the life to come. And if we desire, it helps us to aspire to a high throne for eternity. It allows us to pay the price for our sin in this life and therefore helps us to avoid a part in the lake of fire for eternity. Pray, Father, I ask you to judge me severely and correct me harshly that I may serve you more perfectly. Considering the spiritual journey of man on earth over 7,000 years, at the start, just over 6,000 years ago, human beings only knew good. As a consequence of disobedience and rebellion, they started to learn all there is to learn about evil. This generation, 6,000 years from the creation of mankind, is the most evil generation that has ever lived. Yeshua came and died that we might regain authority on earth. We are called to restore good on earth in order that he may return. At present, Yeshua, having been resurrected because he lived a life without sin, is seated at the right hand of the Father, waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. Looking at this graphically, we see 6,000 years of degradation uh, in terms of the moral fabric of society to where we are today. We see a, a goal which the Almighty has said for a restoration of truth in preparation for a day of judgment. Satan was cast into the pit for 1,000 years in 2003. 2,000 years ago, Yeshua, having regained authority on earth from Satan, 
by living a sinless life, immediately handed that authority to those that followed him and went to sit at the right hand of the Father to await the time when his followers would regain authority on earth and prepare a place for his return. That is not happening because believers do not understand that it is their role to prepare for Yeshua. They mostly believe that Jesus is coming soon and are sitting back waiting for Yeshua to sort out the mess. Yeshua is waiting for us to sort out the mess. We have less than a thousand years in which to do this. Some say much less time. Be prepared no matter the hour of the day. If we truly understood the significance of Yeshua's return, the onset of judgment, we would not be asking for his soon return. This life and the life to come are more complex than most understand. There's a continuum between entirely and completely good, which has only been achieved by Yeshua and Father Yah, and entirely and completely bad, which has only been achieved by Satan. The climb to all good is metaphorically referred to as the mountain of Yah, whereas the slippery descent to all evil is the pit, where Satan is currently imprisoned. If the believers are successful in preparing a place for Yeshua to return to, then Yeshua will return to receive his kingdom, and Satan and his messengers and all those who have not qualified to enter heaven will be cast into the lake of fire. If they do not succeed, then Yeshua will never return and Satan will take control of the earth forever. Here we see a diagram representing the continuum. We'll notice that the majority of people live in the middle section of that graph where they're not really good or bad, but they're not really serving the Almighty. It is difficult to climb up the mountain, hence the image that I've chosen to represent the difficulty of climbing the mountain, and it's relatively easy to slip into the pit. Most people are lukewarm, they're on the gently sloping ground in the middle between serving Yah and serving Satan. Most are oblivious to the battle that is raging all around them in the spiritual realm and are oblivious to the fact that in the absence of concerted action to climb the mountain of Yah they will eventually slide into the pit to be cast into the lake of fire on the day of judgment. Climbing the mountain requires constant focused effort, so if you're not consciously seeking to climb the mountain, you're almost certainly sliding away and towards the pit. Yeshua stated in Mark 12, 29-30, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, Yah the eternally self-existing, our mighty one. Yah the eternally self-existing is one. And you shall love Yah the eternally self-existing, your mighty one, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. In Exodus 20, verse 3, it is written that Yah said on the mountain, You shall have no other mighty ones before me. It is therefore clear that it is sin to equate Yeshua to Yah or to worship Yeshua or in any way conjoin Yeshua to Yah in the way that is customarily done. The part of Yeshua that was Yah was the spirit of Yah on Yeshua.